kings, queens, nerds, and geeks, Power Milker, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria and Chapter 16, Towers. Um, I also, guys, took your advice and went back and made sure I had check on where I was. Like, I went back and saw, like, the ending of the chapter, like you guys suggested. And, you know, so I can get my thing back. So I do know. Then we left a note where there were zombie ponies, and we don't know if they were ponies based on the voice, based on how they were describing the scene. Because it may not be actually ponies, so we don't know. And um, also, guys, I like to say this. Um, it's about yesterday's video I posted, that one that's called I Have Something to Say. Um, all the comments below and in that video, um, I have to thank you so much for all the uh, support you guys showed of my, of my situation. Um, also guys, uh, you guys may not have seen it, but I have, it happened before any of you commented, the first person to comment on that video was very negative about it. And, um, for people out there who are watching this, is, and a, you, you see people do this, report them, because I was in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation, and this person had to make fun of me about it. I later uh, removed his comment, but or she, I don't know who, what this person was, but I removed their comment, and they're no longer there. But, anyway, regarding off that point, we're going back to Fallout Equestria. I want to do this video before I go off. Which, by the way, hey guys, I'm leaving this Saturday to, um, to go back to Arizona, where I am, um, so I can, uh, see my family. Do the uh, my family emergency, um, but so just so you guys know, that's where I'm going to be for about a week. So, and when I come back, I will post a video, and I will uh, post a video saying okay. Also, guys, I'd like to announce that oh crap, um, that I recently hit. 50 subscribers, and I am going to thank all of you for that support, because that was the one good thing, one of the few good things that's happened to me since I got here. Like, since I got back from the field. And, like, and I can tell you the few good things that happened in the field. Like, the Red Cross actually gave me a grant, for example, is one of the good things. For a thousand dollars to pay for my plane ticket home and back. Second of all, guys, this these 50 subscribers, I've always been telling my friend, for every milestone that I hit on YouTube that I was going to celebrate it. And 50, I considered 50 a milestone for me because I know that YouTube is slow and I've been doing this for about a year and I haven't been doing very well. But I figured since now I finally hit 50, after all this time, that I should celebrate it. Um, so, anyway guys, um, let's get on with this. I've been rambling way too long, and I've been excited to go to the next chapter, to be honest. So, I want to really want to find out what happens next, so here we go. Manhattan. Just over 200 years ago, it was a thriving, bustling metropolis. Manhattan was hailed as the most cosmopolitan city in all of Equestria. Millions of ponies lived or worked in the city, and was home to some of the most elite circles of equestrian society. Then, in an instant, Manhattan was gone. Millions of pony lives were consumed in a flash of light, heat, and magical energy. Hundreds of thousands more were killed by the shockwaves and the eldritch green fires that incinerated virtually everything that was left standing. Now all that remained of Manhattan in the aftermath of that apocalypse were the Manhattan ruins. Miles upon miles of maze-like urban devastation and ashes under the shadows of skeletal skyscrapers that rose out of the wreckage like monolithic tombstones. A pony might wonder how such a holocaust could have been allowed to happen. How could Equestria's enemies have smuggled such a cataclysmic weapon into the very heart of our grandest and largest metropolis? 
I found it was much easier to understand now that I knew that the most significant public transportation company in Manhattan was run by trader ponies loyal to Equestria's enemies, and that the basement of this very facility had been the staging ground for zebra operations within our homeland. I stared into the eyes of the zebra zombies and realized that this was how they had gotten the Balefire bomb into Manhattan, that these zebras had been responsible for the murder of millions. I also realized that the mini-stable under four stars fell far short in stable tech's quality. For all the harm stable tech's playing around had done, those ponies really knew how to build a survival shelter. This inferior stable had not been able to stop magical radiation from bleeding in, transforming the zebras and almost a dozen ponies it had been intended to protect into the ghoulish creatures before me. And yes, I realized that they might not be zombie zebras so much as ghoul zebras. I'd say I didn't care, but part of me actually hoped that they were ghouls as I stepped back out of the way. Steelhose, give them everything you've got. The fog lifted by mid-afternoon, revealing the graveyard of the Manhattan ruins beneath a sky of rolling, angry gray. We walked above it, traveling single file along one of the twin monorails of the Luna Line, looking back down on the blocks of city rubble below. In all directions we saw collapsed and gutted buildings, blackened chariots and wagons, detritus and blown litter that had been congregated about the metal shafts of shattered street lamps. No skeletons, though. The living creatures of Manhattan had been reduced to nothing more than ash mixing with the ash from a billion other sources as it was carried by the wind. I was beginning to spot a few small places where green balefire still burned. I wonder how even balefire could have survived for centuries. The wind carried particles of rust and ash, as well as the smells of the urban graveyard. A symphony of creaks and groans haunted the city, mixing with the sounds of shifting and crumbling concrete and the hammering of wind-blown metal. Occasional staccatos of gunfire, usually distant and carried on echoes, reminded us that there were raiders, scavengers, and other ponies lurking in hidden streets and darkened structures. A flash of green and gold shot past us from behind. A magnificent bird, both terrifying and graceful, which spread its wings and circled as if taking in our measure. Its eyes seemed to glow, and licks of balefire fell from its beak. What is that? Velvet Remedy asked with a tone of awe before I could find the words to ask for myself. Balefire Phoenix, Steelhoofs replied, whistling slightly. The green and gold Phoenix. bird completed its circle, then swooped down and away, disappearing from sight as it threaded through shadowed alleys. We began to move again, all except Velvet Remedy, who just stood there as if mesmerized. She turned to Steel. Okay, I remember the only Phoenix that you ever see, like only few Phoenixes you ever see in the, in the My Little Pony show, were the wild ones that you saw with the ponies. During the episode, Oda, when they were looking at when they were studying dragons, you know, because um, apparently there was some kind of weird. Because I remember when Spike wanted to be with dragons, and he was told to steal a phoenix egg, and um, and I and then the the last phoenix, the first phoenix you ever see in the show, was. Was, oh, I can't remember, was it Winona? I think that's the name of the, the Phoenix. I don't remember very well. I haven't seen that episode for a long time. But that Phoenix was uh, Princess Celestia's Phoenix. And it was a pretty funny episode, to be honest, though. Um, but, um, but a Balefire Phoenix... Question being is, is this specific phoenix have been living here forever? Like, because I do know phoenixes can be reborn through ashes after they die. So, what is this phoenix about? Hooves, breathing demandingly. Tell me about them. Whinnying, we halted again. Interesting fact about traveling single file. If one pony stops, unless they're at the back, travel tends to stop with them. I found myself staring at a ruined billboard whose bottle of Sparkle Cola Rad actually seemed to glow. It's like a buck in the face, with radishes. Billboards littered the sky along Luna Line like weeds. The Manhattan Gardens was the largest wildlife sanctuary of its kind, home to the most exotic and admired creatures, all of which were instantly cremated when the zebra's balefire bomb detonated, Steelhoves explained. Of course, a phoenix doesn't exactly have the same relationship with being turned to ash that most creatures do. Steelhoofs chuckled. I wouldn't think of trying to domesticate one. They breathe fire. 
A battered sea blue mare fled out of a doorless storefront and started running down the street, tears streaming from her eyes as she screamed. A dozen raider ponies, each carrying a brutal weapon and wearing an old roller derby helmet, came tearing out of the building after her, jumping out the windows and charging out the door, whooping and laughing. Help me! She stumbled as she ran, her gait hobbled. Blood ran down between her thighs. I could see her bleeding through my scope. Please, somebody help me! She'd already been raped repeatedly. Now they had let her go and were chasing her for sport. From the height of the Luna line, we were too far for sats to effectively lock on, so I trailed the scope in front of the first raider, a mottled ground and bray pony with a cutie mark of a skull with burning eyes, aiming for he was about to be as Calamity instructed. Good, now keep her steady and squeeze out a burst. I magically pulled the trigger. Three shots spat out of the scoped zebra assault carbine. Silenced weapons, I learned, were not really silent, but the dampened sound was lost in the wind, and the weight of the silencer helped soften the recoil and keep the rifle on target between bullets. The raider pony burst into flame. He fell to the ground, screaming and thrashing. I stepped back, floating up the rifle to check the clip while Calamity took a shot. No, I hadn't accidentally loaded magical bullets. The zebra rifle had enchanted the bullet itself. Stick a horn where Celestia don't shine. If this was the sort of weapon that zebras had been carrying into the battlefield... The screams of the victim mare below wrenched my attention back to the battle. Calamity fired off a second shot. Pulling the scope into my eyes, I saw that three of the raiders were now dead, one of the corpses burning in the street, and the others were scattering. The panicking mare screamed, her hooves catching on a toppled street lamp, and fell, skidding across the debris-strewn street. One of the raiders was still charging towards her. I swung my scope towards him, and froze as I really saw him. One of the rapists had been a blank-flanked colt. I stared, following the very young pony with the zebra's rifle scope, trembling slightly. He was wearing a colt's roller derby helmet and clenched a serrated knife in his mouth. I could see blood on him. I focused, the trigger of the zebra rifle moving slightly. I couldn't. It was a colt. Horrified, I watched as the colt reached the fallen mare, dodging the kicks she threw at him. I heard the crack of gunfire feet from me, and saw the colt's body rupture bloodily in two places, hit with enough force to fling his corpse against a nearby mailbox. I lowered the zebra rifle and turned to stare at Calamity in shock. On the other side of him, Velvet Remedy's eyes were wide. What? Calamity asked before flying down to help the mare. Did I steal your shot? Ponies love laughter. Zebras do not understand joy and fear it. Ponies are honest. Zebras tell only lies. Ponies are loyal. Zebras will knife you in the back. Ponies are generous. Zebras are selfish and greedy. Ponies care about each other. Zebras care only for themselves. I stared up at the billboard and thought, Wow. That's... that's just wrong, Velvet Remedy said, breaking the uncomfortable silence that had become our traveling companion since Calamity shot the raider colt. The twin monorail tracks took a graceful curve, and the billboard was mounted across the flying buttresses of a squat skyscraper, placed so that the train ponies would see it as they approached the turn. It would have dominated the view out on one side of the elevated train as it took the bend. Calamity had flown off ahead, more to give us space than out of need to scout. The Luna Line seemed free of threats. I really wanted a party-time mint owl. I didn't have any particular need for one, but I felt myself craving the effects, especially the intellectual boosts. I could just think so much faster, so much more clearly while benefiting from a PTM. I was more aware, my senses more acute. If that's what Party Time Mint Owls did for me, I began to wonder what they did for Pinkie Pie. I found myself thinking about Four Stars again. Based on what we had found at the Mini Stable, which wasn't much after Steelhoof's ordinance was finished with the Zebras, the Ministry of Morale raid must have happened the same morning that the Balefire Bomb was set off. It occurred to me that the Megaspell was probably in transit when they attacked. The Ministry of Morale had brought in Steel Rangers. They knew what they were heading into calling for big guns. Knowing where to look, who to interrogate. Did that come from the skill of the ponies in her employment? Or did Pinkie Pie herself discern these things with the power of PTM-enhanced acumen? Biased, I presume the latter. No matter the negative effects she might have suffered from PTM addiction, Pinkie Pie had intuition that bordered on precognition. The traitors were terrified of her ministry. She had them paranoid and scurrying. And no matter what any pony might say about either her or her ministry, Pinkie Pie had come heartbreakingly close to saving Manhattan. 
I stopped, looking out over the desolate urban maze. Millions of ponies had died there, their salvation racing the clock and losing. I had to find something else to think about. I switched on DJ Pony's radio broadcast, listening to it on my earbloom. It was merely a distraction. I knew all the songs by heart now. I hoped DJ Pony found something in the records we carried worthy of expanding his musical repertoire. This just in, DJ Pony announced between songs. Just got a report that a weak distress signal can be heard near the Horseshoe Tower. Seems like Blackwing's towns have managed to get themselves in over their beaks. Well, don't worry, Blackwing. Horseshoe Tower is pretty close to Sheriff Rottingtail's territory. Maybe some of his ghouls will be willing to lend you a hoof. Oh, wait, that's right. You and your mercs slaughtered them all. Well, good luck with that. This is DJ Pony reminding every pony in the equestrian wasteland, you reap what you sow. Calamity was flying back towards us. I turned off the radio on my pit buck as he landed on the monorail. Y'all gonna love this. Several minutes later, we had trotted far enough along the curve to see what Calamity had told us about. Ahead, the Celestial Line crossed over the Luna Line. About twenty feet above Luna Line, running perpendicular to the twin monorails below, the dark underside of the twin Celestial Rails struck me as bizarrely textured, giving me the creeps. Well, how do we get up there? Velvet Remedy scoffed. Calamity rolled his eyes and fluttered his wings. I care y'all up there as how. Except I'm thinking our steel ranger friend is a mud heavy for me. I can levitate him up as you carry me, I offered. Calamity nodded. All right, then. Just be careful, little Pip. You don't want to disturb the blood wings. Blood wings? I floated out the binoculars, peering through them at the celestial line, and cringed with a gasp. The shadowed underbellies of the monorails were covered with the grotesque leathery forms of dozens of giant mutant bats. Yep. I figure we best make good time to ten pony. Reckon we don't want to be outside in the open come nightfall. As difficult as it was to get onto the Celestia line, getting off the monorail was easy. Twilight was falling as we rounded a bend and were met with a graceful arch of tarnished silver which flowed up and over the monorails. Through the arch, we could finally see Ten Pony Tower in its surprisingly well-preserved splendor. We'd been catching glimpses of it above and between the buildings for hours, but only now could we really take in the size and ornateness of the structure. Light glowed behind more than half of the windows, most of which bore fractures but were fully intact. The building narrowed every dozen stories with a level ringed by a patio balcony, the fencing around each spotted with crude repair. One whole side of Ten Pony Tower was blackened and sagging, bulwarked by patchwork reinforcements added over the post-apocalyptic decades. The original name of the building had collapsed into the cobblestone courtyard below. A huge radio broadcast tower rose from the roof towards the sky. The monorails passed under the archway, which would once have been dazzling in the sun, and right up to Ten Pony Tower where they ran through a Four Stars Embarking Station built into the side of the tower many stories above the ground. From the tarnished arch hung a sign proclaiming, Ministry of Arcane Science, Manhattan Hub. Entering the station, we saw guard ponies barricaded behind massive steel walls, watching our approach through narrow slits as they followed our progress with their guns. The walls of the station were decorated with life-size paintings of ponies. Once, the paintings had been protected by magical fields of energy similar to Velvet Remedy's spell. Now, most of the paintings were blackened, damaged, or defaced beyond repair, the shields having failed and the gemstones which held their enchantments stolen. All save for one, a painting of a familiar purple unicorn, the once pink and violet stripes of her mane mostly changed to gray. I hopped onto the sidewalk that ran along the wall, giving the painting a closer look. The edges were charred and the paint had blistered in the heat, but the protective field still held. The others paused, watching me, but I waved them on. I just want to look. I'll catch up. Each of my companions nodded and trotted on, none of them seeming to possess my curiosity. While no spring filly, Twilight Sparkle at least looked a decade younger in this painting than in the memory of Pinkie Pie's last party, and considerably happier. She was surrounded by crisp autumn colors, a number of hazy, barely rendered ponies creating colorful blotches around her in the background. Her cutie mark was hidden, covered by a flank blanket bearing the number 10. The running of the leaves. A voice announced from behind me, startling me so badly I nearly jumped back to my death. I turned to glare at the sprite bot which had seemed to materialize out of nowhere. Twilight Sparkle ran it every year in Ponyville. Never won. To me, the mechanical voice sounded... nostalgic. That was until the Ministry demanded all of her time. 
I gazed at the purple pony with the ten on her flank. Then I looked up to the mostly intact skyscraper which had once been the Ministry of Magic Hub. The mass of letters that once advertised its name fallen and shattered onto the ground below. And then I looked back. <laughs> I smiled. Turning to the sprite bot. How did you know twi- But with the crackle of static, Watcher was gone, the sprite bot suddenly spewing tuba music. I scowled as I watched the spherical robot bob away. Was it just me, or were the conversations with Watcher getting shorter? Ponies don't simply walk into Tempony Tower, the guard pony informed us, scowling through an armored window as he spoke through the intercom. The words No Zombies were painted across the gate in huge red letters. We have business with DJ Pony, Velvet Remedy stated loftily. Although, if you want to explain to him that you turned us away... DJ Pony's expecting you, then. Absolutely, Velvet Remedy lied silkily. And if I were you, I would not keep him waiting. All of you? The voice was skeptical. Velvet Remedy gave an overly dramatic sigh. This is my bodyguard, she claimed, pointing to Calamity. And I'm sure you recognize a member of the Steel Rangers. I, uh, I do. And... Velvet Remedy looked to me and seemed to draw a blank. Hastily, I offered. Toaster repair pony. Every pony gave me a strange look. His, um... Toasters on the fritz? Velvet Remedy looked pained. The guard contemplated us silently. Finally, Velvet Remedy said, Look, as much as I'd love to just stand here outside while you get in trouble for not letting us in, it is getting dark. Would 100 bottle caps help move this along? 200. 125. And I don't tell DJ Pony that you tried to exhort his guests. Fine. The gun slot opened in the door. Slide the caps through, then you can come in. I started pulling out and counting bottle caps. I was going to have to start bundling them into small pouches of twenty to make this sort of thing easier. Two hundred was a large chunk of the bottle caps we'd managed to acquire, but I wasn't worried. We had plenty of guns and ammo to sell once inside. Oh, the guard added, and you'll have to disarm before passing through the checkpoint. Stick a horn. Y'all ain't getting my battle sad unless you pry it up my cold dead. The guard scoffed. Wouldn't expect to. You don't have to turn in your firearms and battle saddles. Just your ammo. All of it. I raised my eyebrows in surprise. Unexpected. That also severely cut our trade goods, but at least left us with the more expensive and heavier objects to sell off. As we passed through the checkpoint, a unicorn stepped out of the guard post and waved her horn over us. Every clip, bullet, grenade, and missile flashed visibly, even through Steelhoof's metal armor. Toast repair pony. She repeated with a demure smile as her gaze passed over my sniper rifle, combat shotgun, zebra rifle, assault carbine. I face hoofed. And a steel ranger? She asked as she removed the missiles from the left side of Steelhoof's battle saddle. And what is your story? Steelhoof's whinnied. I'm just here to make sure you don't have any more nasty ghoul problems. Oh, that is no longer a concern, she smiled. But thank you for the concern. Indeed. Can't have filthy ghouls just walking in anywhere. Calamity was shooting Steelhoof's dark looks. Velvet Remedy nickered under her breath, just loud enough to make sure she was heard. Oh yes, they're unsightly things. Can't imagine anything worse. Except maybe a cult killer. Calamity neighed and rolled his eyes, lowering the brim of his hat. In minutes, we were divested of all of our ammunition. You all get these back when you leave. The unicorn promised primly as she collected it all and floated it into the guardhouse. I feel strangely naked, Calamity complained. At least my weapons had only been reduced to fancy clubs. You can probably buy some rubber bullets from Chief Grimstar if you feel you really need to, the unicorn informed us as the guardhouse door slid shut behind her. Calamity and I exchanged surprised looks. It was the first I'd heard of any pony utilizing non-lethal ordnance. Okay, for me, when I play Fallout, ammo, ammunition is the number one priority, and I can't go anywhere without ammunition in that game, because I suck at video games. I repeat, I suck at video games. Ugh. Ah. Ah. 
So you can imagine how much this makes you feel when you find out you can't bring in your ammo. There was a loud clank as something released inside the ornate armored double doors in front of us. They opened, swinging inwards and revealing the marbled chandelier-lit station lobby of Ten Pony Tower. We were getting looks. The idea of high society was completely foreign to me. We'd had nothing like this sort of bizarre elitism in Stable 2. The Wasteland was a dirty, broken, rusted place that was completely at odds with this stuffy behavior. The only reason a pony might walk around with their nose in the air in places like New Appaloosa was because they didn't want to smell what they were walking in. Let us hurry and find a place to make bed, the Velvet Remedy pushed. I need a bath. Hell, these folks make me feel like I need a bath, Calamity said, his head low, feeling the weight of all the stairs. You do. I nodded, wondering just how we would find a place to stay. We were walking across a mezzanine filled with high-class shops, or at least high-class relative to the rest of the equestrian wasteland. If we wanted to buy or sell anything here, Velvet Remedy had her work cut out for her. I suspected that she was the only one here with enough mercantile savoir faire to get these ponies to even talk to her. Velvet Remedy seemed to read my mind. Once we've bathed and rested, we should split up. I'll take our goods to sell first thing in the morning, and then purchase us some new formal wear that will help us blend in. Little Pip, you should look into meeting with DJ Pony. I agreed. I want to find a workshop. I want to modify my battle saddle. Till traveling with Little Pip, I never had any more than one type of ammo. Want to set up a quick way to swap between ammo types. Be nice to be able to use rubber bullets when situation calls for it. He looked at Velvet Remedy and me. Y'all should give me your gun so I can do some proper maintenance while I'm at it. Velvet Remedy floated her needler pistol over to him. Situations like shooting a colt, perhaps. Calamity neighed. Nope. I see a raider. I'm gonna take him down. The rust-colored pony stared defiantly at Velvet Remedy, proudly insisting. It's my policy. It was a child, Velvet Remedy hissed, giving a stomp. I looked around. My companions were beginning to make a scene. Um, maybe we should save this for... Any pony who chooses to be a filthy murderer and raider gets tried and perforated as an adult, Calamity asserted. And you think a culture filly in that situation had any actual choice? <coughs> Calamity's eyes narrowed as he cocked his head. Sorry, I'm well, maybe not. Here. Damn tragedy. But that don't mean I'm gonna give him a free pass to rape and murder till he gets his cutie mark. His would-be future victims don't deserve that. Calamity's voice was rising dangerously. In case you don't notice, my little rapist down there. Shut up, I finally ordered. Oh, I swear to the goddesses, I'm going to put both of you in corners. Velvet Ramney and Calamity both bristled. But the interruption was enough to get them to look around and realize that this was not the place to be having that particular fight. The two of them remained silent for the rest of the evening while I found us a place at the Golden Tales Luxury Suites. It was a beautiful room, the marble walls only slightly cracked, the twin bathtubs were only lightly stained, and the sheets and beds were not too worn or frayed. I probably paid double what Velvet Remedy would have gotten it for, but I was happy just to get them away from the public. Tempers were more even the next morning. We had all bathed and washed our clothing. Calamity spent the first part of the morning sewing and patching our armor. My armored utility barding had been crusted with blood and punctured with bullet holes. Meanwhile, Velvet Remedy packed up all the weapons and scavenged items for trade and headed out before the stores were open, waiting to look over her options. I spent the morning hungry. We decided that we would wait until Velvet Remedy returned with proper ten-pony attire before heading out to buy food. There were several swanky-looking restaurants that we had passed on our way to the Golden Tail Luxury Suites, and I was sick of canned and boxed pre-war food, which, as Velvet reminded us, we were almost out of and would need to stock up on. I took the chance to relax laying on one of the beds and reading. I had nearly finished all of the books I had collected, and I had contemplated giving most of them to Velvet Remedy to sell. But, in the end, I decided that I would rather keep them back at my Junction R7 home. Start a library. When Velvet returned, bringing us all new clothing, even a stately cloak for steel hooves, I nearly fell out of bed at the sight of her. She would treated herself to new coiffure and a pony petty, and she was wearing a classy new dress with matching new jewelry along with a demure touch of blush. She flooded her longer-than-ever eyelashes at me, and I felt faint. Part of me hated her for making me want her so much. Wow, Velvet, you look. Calamity flushed, looking a little overheated, but he stammered something about hoping she had saved enough bottle caps for us to have breakfast. She turned her nose up at him. Of course I did. 
Looking to me, she broke into a cheerful grin, clopping her hoofs together. And we have plenty extra to do a little shopping. What do they have? Velvet Remedy smirked, rolling her eyes. Oh, you wouldn't believe. These ponies have taken full of themselves to a whole new level. She snickered. Two floors down, there's a shop that sells only cheese. Right across from a shop that sells only wine. As classy as she could be, Velvet Remedy didn't put any more value in being snobbish than the rest of us. But of course, half the fun of shopping is just looking. Why, was there something you were looking for? Some new books and rubber bullets. Velvet Remedy sighed. The restaurant was classy and filled with prim-looking ponies. I looked at my plate of food with a touch of depression. I don't know why I had expected much more. It wasn't as if the ponies of Ten Pony Tower were farmers with fields. I'm going to mention this right now. Um, I have to say right now that Pip is reminding me of Twilight a lot. You know how she was reading, always reading up on things. In fact, so this might be her thing. You know, um, what is her virtue? She might be the magic virtue. No, she's not good at magic. Her virtue might be magic because she relates to Twilight the most. And how she tries to solve things logically rather than reason. Fields of fresh grains. Instead, we got the same pre-war foods, only cooked in new ways and served in tiny but artistic proportions. It didn't take long to eat, and I was still hungry. After breakfast, we split up. Calamity and Steelhoofs went to find Chief Grimstar, hoping to purchase bullets and possibly a suit of armored barding more suitable for Velvet Remedy. The Zebra Legionnaire suit was stored away in Steelhoofs' packs. Velvet Remedy didn't feel right wearing it, especially as she walked over the graves of countless ponies the Zebras had murdered, and I didn't blame her. But I hated to just leave it or sell it when it could be useful. Velvet and I went to purchase supplies. Food was a high priority, especially since I had no intention of eating at a restaurant again for as long as we were here. Looking at the rows of cans and boxes and fine edibles, I cringed at the prices. Maybe we should just get the minimum we will need for the next couple days. We're bound to find more if we do a bit of scavenging. Velvet Remedy agreed, but only because she had other intentions for the caps we would save by doing so. We stocked up lightly, then I watched as Velvet Remedy haggled with the shop clerk until she got us a discount. As soon as we left Fine Edibles, I found myself being shoved into a spa where Velvet Remedy absolutely insisted we both get full-body treatments. I was resistant at first, but as I began to unwind in the steam room, feeling muscles loosen that had probably been tight since my last night in the stable, I found myself letting out a grand sigh of relief. A couple of delightful spa ponies gave us an absolutely heavenly massage. This was easily the best caps I had ever spent. And, truth be told, the spa mare hoofing my back was beginning to really turn me on. I heard that Fluttershy went to one of these places every week with my great, great, add a bunch of greats here, grand aunt. Velvet Remedy confided as the lovely spa pony rubbed her hooves on my shoulders. I suddenly felt extra awkward. Later, as we lounged in a mud bath, my eye spotted a book sitting alone on a counter. Curious, I floated over to take a look. Principles of proper pony speech, I read aloud. Refining how we think by refining how we speak. I opened the book and looked down at the title page. At the bottom, in small words, official guidelines from the Ministry of Image. I decided to ask the spa pony if I could buy the book. Ministry we were of returning Image, to that's our room after the most delightful morning I did probably ever, and my attention was focused on slipping my newly purchased book into my saddlebags when I collided with a stallion who was backing out of the cheese shop, knocking Finally, over. I get to find out where she My runs. book fell on the floor, along with a number of boxes full of cheese. I recovered and began to offer him apologies and assistance when my eyes fell on the cheese-shaped cutie mark on his beige flank. You! Monterey Jack stood up, dusting himself off. Oh, it's you. A short gray unicorn wearing a refined full barding trotted out and looked at the scattered cheese, then at us. Is there a problem here? Yeah, this pony tried to rob me, after I saved his life. Now I was the one creating a scene. And I didn't care. Velvet Remedy was staring. Monterey Jack started picking up the boxes of cheese, lifting them with again. his teeth by their wrapping strings. He ignored me like I was some small, yapping animal. Is that true? The gray unicorn asked, looking to Monterey Jack. Monterey just snorted and finished sacking the cheese boxes, then focused, floating them towards the gray unicorn in the suit. Sorry about that homage. I'll credit your account 10% for the rough handling. 
Yes, it's true. I supplied for the beige unicorn. Of course his cutie mark looked like cheese. Monterey Jack ran the cheese shop. A guard pony in old MAS security armor and an LSW battle saddle was walking towards us. Turning towards him, I pointed at Monterey. Sir, I'd like this pony arrested. The guard pony looked both of us up and down. On what charge? Attempted robbery. The guard chuckled. Monterey Jax's prices might be steep, but that's a stretch. I shook my head. No, I rescued him from raiders and he repaid me by trying to rob me. Turning a glare on Monterey Jack, I added, They were going to shoot your hooves off, if I remember correctly. Maybe I should have let them. The guard looked at me skeptically. When was this? I paused, then double-checked the date on my pit buck. Three weeks ago. Had it really only been that long? I felt like I'd been outside a lot longer. Yeah, it feels like Sorry, it too. the guard said finally. But it's your word against his, and frankly, seeing as how you aren't a ten-pony citizen, your word doesn't mean much here. I fumed. You mean he gets away with it? A little pip, Velvet Remedy said softly, putting a calming hoof on my shoulder. Put it in the past. He may have tried to rob you, but he didn't succeed. I shrugged her off with a hoof and rounded on Monterey Jack. So, you're just going to stand there and deny it, are you? Well, I... No, he said firmly. I'm not going to... Wait, what? Monterey? Homage was looking at the beige cheese shop unicorn, her purchases momentarily forgotten. The guard pony had suddenly stiffened. I had two colts and a filly to look after. I had to make it home safely, and those supplies would have been wasted on you. You weren't even smart enough to loot the corpses. You wouldn't have survived the week. Clearly not, Velvet Remedy deadpanned. Monterey Jack, the guard said seriously, do you realize what you're admitting here? Monterey Jack snorted, staring at me. I'm not a liar, and I'm not ashamed of what I tried to do. Making sure my children still have a father is more important to me than some foolish little stranger doesn't have the good sense not to walk into a slaver camp. He looked to the guard. After Clarinet was killed, I'm all they have left. The guard pony neighed. Well, probably not anymore. You know the law. Banditry will get you executed. Wait, 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 wait. What? Velvet Remedy gasped. The guard clamped the bit on his battle saddle, and I heard the light support weapon reload. Sorry, Monterey Jack, but you're going to have to come with me. Um, I've changed my mind. I'm not pressing charges. Nothing happened. The guard scowled at me. Sorry, kid, but it's your word against his. And like I said, your non-citizen word doesn't mean the dirt on my hoof around here. I paced back and forth outside the elevator. This was insane. Wait. They couldn't kill a pony for trying and failing to rob some pony, could they? Goddesses, why didn't I just keep my stupid mouth shut? The elevator doors opened. I left Velvet Remedy looking into the laws of Ten Pony Tower, hoping she could find something while I attempted to talk That's to DJ right. Pony. Stepping into the elevator, I added this to the list of things that I wanted to ask him about. For that matter, why couldn't Monterey Jack have just kept his own mouth shut? In the equestrian wasteland, honesty was not always a virtue. The elevator began to glide upwards. I took a deep breath. I was about to meet DJ Pony. I wondered what to expect. I hoped he'd be willing to talk to me. If not, then this would have been one long walk for nothing. Well, no, not nothing. It was a long walk for a spa treatment. Actually, still somewhat worth it. The doors opened, and I stepped out into a rich marble foyer, the center of which was dominated by a water fountain. A huge alicorn made of aged darkened brass reared up before me, wings spread out over the foyer. The necklace around the alicorn's neck bore a water talisman with a large sapphire set into the center. Thanks to the talisman, the fountain still flowed with fresh, clean water, even two hundred years after the apocalypse. I remembered the pure and non-irradiated water we had enjoyed in our baths and in the spa, and I wondered just how many water talismans the MAS hub had, and how many could benefit from them if they weren't all hoarded together in this one place. Stairs wrapped around the foyer to a mezzanine level. Inset in the balcony were matching bronze letters. Ministry of Arcane Science, Manhattan. Beyond the fountain was a large set of double doors bearing the title, Twilight Sparkle Athenium. Above on the mezzanine was a second, nearly identical set of double doors. MAS Emergency Broadcast Station, authorized unicorns only. Is she that famous? 
I took a deep breath and stepped towards the stairs. A second pair of elevator doors slid open behind me. I turned to see the gray unicorn mare, Homage, step out and look around. I smiled, trying not to look too nervous. You're here to see DJ Pony, too? The other unicorn nodded. She was about my size, the only other adult pony I'd seen who was born with a similar small frame. I waved a hoof for her to go first. She was a citizen, after all. When we reached the landing, the double doors to the MASEBS swung open silently, making me think of the wild tale of Manhattan ghosts the traveling merchant had told us about. Inside were multiple mainframes and walls of computer screens giving a bird's eye view of the vast majority of the equestrian wasteland, as far as I could tell. Homage clomped past me as I stopped to stare. Searching about, I spotted New Appaloosa on one of them. Impressive, isn't it? Homage asked. I nodded, noticing that while most screens had clear, sharp images, several flickered and suffered odd distortions, and one large set of screens was dead black. You've been here before? Oh, a few times. She walked over to a bank of buttons and lights, raising a hoof to press one. She turned and trotted back towards the center of the room where a microphone was raising from the floor. Ollidge's horn glowed and her voice changed by magic. Good morning, Wastelanders! Homage cried into the mic, her voice now male and very familiar. How is every pony doing? This is your pal, DJ Pony, and, well, it's that time again. That's right, time for some news. I fell to my haunches, staring as the little gray unicorn's voice belted over the airwaves. I heard a rumor that Monterey Jack, cheese shop owner in that oh-so-hoity-toity ten-pony tower, has been arrested for deciding that being a thieving jackass is the appropriate response to an act of kindness. Remember what I keep telling you, my little ponies. Treat each other with kindness and respect. Or don't, and watch it come back to bite you in the tail. In other news, some ponies finally arrived to fix my toaster. Hallelujah, it's breakfast time. Here's a little sapphire shores to get you through the morning. Ten minutes later, I stood on the windswept roof of Ten Pony Tower as Homage made a refining adjustment to the gemstone set in the center of one of the dishes on the broadcast tower. I stared out over the gray labyrinth of Manhattan. From here, I could see another Ministry Hub building which was considerably worse for wear, Horseshoe Tower, and even the Pony of Friendship out in the harbor. Breathtaking blue oceans stretched out into the waters vanished under offshore fog. Ironic, isn't it? Homage asked, her voice no longer that of DJ Pony. I'm told that statue was a gift from the zebra folks generations before the war. I turned to look at her, but caught sight of something far off on the horizon that grabbed my attention. A needle-like white tower rose all the way into the clouds. I blinked, realizing I'd seen it before, but not over there. Before, when I'd spotted it in the distance, it was... I turned to look out in the direction I knew the tower should have been and saw. There were two of them. I pulled out my binoculars and slowly turned, scanning the horizon. Far off, protruding from the mountains near old Appaloosa, I thought I spotted the third. How many of these towers were there? Oh, I see you've spotted them, Ahmed said casually. I lowered the binoculars. What are they? No idea, Homage admitted. Something pre-war and really sophisticated. What I do know is that each one has a station house at the base and observation eyes about a third of the way up. DJ Pony managed to hack into one of them. Between those eyes and reports from loyal listeners, every DJ Pony since has been able to keep ponies informed about dangers, uplifted by tales of heroes and generally appraised of what goes on in the wasteland, and give them beautiful music to help make life out there more bearable. It's all I can do to help every pony, but I figure the most I can do is the least I can do. I looked to homage with amazement bordering on reverence. You, on the other hoof, it seems can do a lot more. And so I'd like your help. DJ Pwn3, which I thought was male, is female. Okay, not surprising. But, the voice thing. What the fuck? What the fuck? Homage, right? That's her name. Homage? Homage? Or whatever? Um... What the fuck? Okay, I've been confused this whole freaking chapter, because... This chapter's just going twist and turns of things I didn't expect. I didn't expect to see Monterey Jack again. Well, not see, but hear of. But I didn't expect to see Monterey Jack again. And I did not expect this to just happen. 
Like, what the fuck? I do remember in Fallout 3, the DJ you meet is male. So, eh, I guess it should be surprised that most of the freaking population of ponies is female. Like, seriously, most of the characters you see in My Little Pony are female! They make up a good 70 of the population. So, eh, I guess that's a good thing for the males. Okay, I should stop being a perv. Anyway, um, anyway guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this, uh, uh, video, um, of, um, of Fallout Equestria. Um, I'm not sure what to think right now, but, damn, what the fuck? Well, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later, and I, I hope to see you guys in the next video of Fallout Equestria when I come back. So, bye.